Hello, I'm Anna Delaney with Information Security Media Group, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Martin Mikos and Alex Rice of Hacker One. Great to see you, gentlemen. Good to see you. Good to see you. So let's start off with misconceptions. What are some of the misconceptions around engaging an ethical hacker to find vulnerabilities in an organization? Want to go first? There's something that every business is starting to yeah. recognize as a core part of being competitive in this market, which is trust. How do you earn the trust of your prospects, your customers, your users? And the most powerful phrase in trust is, don't take our word for it. You need third-party proof points, you need other partners, you need other interest members to help build trust and convey what your practices are. And one of the strongest ways to do that is to ask the ethical hacker community, what have we missed? What have we not done right? What, uh, what are we not seeing that, that you see out there also? And I feel too many folks look at hackers purely as, as adversaries or ways to get more secure. But one of the biggest misconceptions is just how central they are to whether or not people should trust you. And I think it's very powerful when folks start to uh, approach them that way. And these add, Martin. Well, I look at it as uh, for CISOs, when they are running their operation, they're trying to build strength. So they look for how they can get stronger. And if they could realize that what they don't know is a source of strength, that a vulnerability can be a source of strength. And that's a little bit mental jujitsu to get there. <laughs> but then you realize that it's true. And I just spoke to a CISO who said, I'm interested in what I don't know. Don't tell me what I know. Tell me what I don't know. The only ones who can tell you what you don't know are ethical hackers. Everybody else has been listening too much to you, has ownership bias. They don't want to upset their boss. They are operating according to a sort of pre-described script. But the ethical hackers will come in and tell you exactly what, in a moment, you didn't want to hear, but deep down you know you must hear. And that's how you become stronger. And when you look at those who operate bug bounty programs or vulnerability disclosure programs today, every single company that does that is stronger than its competitors. Every single one. So the evidence is overwhelming. But you have to, in your mind, realize that what you don't know is actually a source of strength. So how do ethical hackers compare and contrast to, say, in-house red teams or pen testers? I'd start by saying anyone who has their own in-house team and has arrived at the opinion that that's all I need, I have the smartest people, we know everything there is to possibly know in the world, is coming from a place of arrogance that isn't worthy of your trust. You want to look for technology leaders and security leaders that have retained a healthy amount of humility in their practices. They invest, they believe in their strength, they, they know that they're strong, but they're also constantly looking for sources of strength elsewhere. And that's how we think about the hacker community. It's not a either or, it's a yes and. Your teams are stronger together when they work with ethical hackers, when they have feedback loops from the outside when you have the humility to say, I can't possibly know everything, what is it that other folks know that I don't yet know? Uh, it's a question of diversity. You can hire the best security people to your company. You can hire many, you can hire hundreds, but you can never achieve the diversity that we have in the community. And in a community of ethical hackers, the vast majority are always wrong but the small minority is always right. But if you hire 10 security experts, you, get, you don't get diversity. You have a high, hundred better, but it's costing you million, tens of millions. If you, if you try to hire more, you will run out of money, run out of ability to hire them. But we come with 1.7 million who have the diversity and you don't need to hire them all full time. You hire just the thing you need it at that moment and this machinery of diversity is what distinguishes ethical hackers from in-house experts. The in-house experts might be better trained, smarter, more productive, like they, they are better in many ways, but they, they, it's impossible for them to have the diversity that you have outside. And that's why it's so obvious that if you can afford an in-house team, you should have it, but you will always need the outside world because there you get with a fractional payment method, you get access to full diversity. 
which you can never get inside. Not even the largest com companies. Look at Google, Microsoft, Amazon. How many security experts do they have? It's not enough. Even they don't have enough. There's a lot of talk at the moment about ChatGPT and AI tools serving as adequate pen testing tools for security teams. Do you think that this is a bit of a competition to the ethical hacker? Do you think that these tools will replace the, the industry as we know it? No. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> AI is a tool. It's a stepping, uh, something to step on, a ladder to step on to get higher, whether you are a criminal, whether you are an ethical hacker, whether you're a pen tester, whoever you are, AI makes you more powerful. But it makes the criminals more powerful, so it makes the defenders more powerful, but it will never compete with the actual solving of the problem that only human beings can do. We, we've had in the cybersecurity industry a belief that tech can solve a problem, that if you place a firewall in front of your system, you're safe. It's not true. All difficult problems are solved by humans. And if you get philosophical, uh, the Austrian philosopher Gödel proved this, that whatever new technology you add, it will solve problems, but it will add new problems. So it will, we will never run out of work for humans, but the work will rise up to a higher level. And so ethical hackers will stop working on very low level, low hanging fruit and go after more advanced or more logical ones. Like in an AI deployment, you have to look for algorithmic bias. You have to look for hallucination. You have to look for all kinds of new vulnerabilities that didn't exist half a year ago. So there's more work, not less. Yeah, yeah. Top of all, AI has come a phenomenal way in the last few years. And I do agree we're going to start seeing it deployed across the board on the defender side and, and offensive side. But best in class AI today, the best it can claim is 60% of the time, it's right every time. And you start to realize how essential humans are to that process. Their accuracy is getting phenomenal. It's right most of the time. But AI believes it's right all the time. It doesn't recognize its faults. It still takes human intelligence to implement the tools correctly, to leverage them correctly, and to provide the feedback loops that allow you to iterate and advance AI to actually get the outcomes that we're looking for. AI is going to continue advancing, but we're decades away from it being deployed in a truly autonomous way where you can take humans out of the picture. And the only way we're ever going to get there is by deeply coupling human intelligence and artificial intelligence side by side. Hey, have you spoken to ethical hackers that you, you work with that have used ChatGPT already and say, how does that enhance their own work? I mean, have they given you feedback on the technology? Absolutely. Yeah? So there's AI deployed across our own platform and hackers are leveraging AI in creative ways across the board to, to level themselves up today. So we're actively seeing it and have been for the past several years on both the offense and the defensive side. On the customer side, you see some of the leading AI companies out there. Uh, Twitter, for example, launched a bounty competition where they asked the world to identify sources of bias in their image cropping uh, algorithms and had a phenomenally successful challenge where research groups across the world came together to point out areas where their uh, algorithms were prioritizing certain skin tones or body types or facial expressions in ways that have active harm across the community. And it's the, the type of spot things that you can't spot without humans working hand in hand with AI to produce outcomes that are actually good for all of us. Yeah. So talk to me about best practices for an organization. How do we, how do they engage an ethical hacker? Best practices and also pitfalls to avoid. Uh, the, pit, the biggest pitfall is to do nothing <laughs> and to be in denial and many are. So it is a real challenge. Once you get going today, like you could do it yourself, but if you use a vendor with a platform. We've made it really simple for you. You can do a crawl, walk, run approach and start small. And it sort of doesn't matter where you start as long as you start. So movement is the most important here. And learning. If, if somebody really wants to become among the best in benefiting from this, they should take every learning and go back and ask, how should they have designed the software in the first place to potentially avoid this vulnerability. So that sort of that represents the highest level of knowledge that you look at Oreo vulnerabilities, you fix them, and then you go back home to Oreo developers say, how do we change software design? How do we change the frameworks we are using? 
how do we uh, change the way we design and write software so that we will have fewer of these in the future. And it absolutely works. We've done it with leading companies for 10 years now and they go back and have sessions with their developers to make sure that the developers understand it. So developers must be in charge of cybersecurity themselves. Unfortunately, if you study computer science today at the university, they teach you no cybersecurity, most of them. They just teach you how to code. They don't teach you how to code securely. So there are big changes needed in society before we get fully there. But if you are an ambitious uh, CISO running your, your show very well, you will take the learnings back to the first stage of the SDLC. Absolutely, yeah. plus one, that the biggest pitfall continues to be organizations that think security is something you can bolt on after the fact. Software is eating every industry and every business that we engage with, and the strongest ones, the most trustworthy ones, are those that are taking a shared responsibility for security across the entire software company. So just to share an example of how you engage, HackerOne engages ethical hackers and also deploys them, how does it work in practice? Yeah. Um, the simplest way to think about it is outside of security. Any type of product, particularly software-driven products that you're deploying, has flaws and bugs in it to start with. That should surprise none of us, that whatever grand technology we've dreamed up and whatever hopes we have for how it's going to behave in the market, it doesn't behave as we expect. There are bugs, there are flaws, there are unexpected corner cases that we didn't account for. And you have to approach security with the exact same mindset. The different types of automation and AI and structured ways of approaching that can catch a lot of the areas that you're going to, but nothing prepares you for how software will behave in the real world, like putting it in the real world and asking real humans to ask, how would you break this? How would you attack this? How would you exploit this? What are the real world consequences of it? And I think that's where we get the most value with our customers is showing them how their technology is behaving in the real world as part of the real world tech service. In a way, we have, we've now built a platform where we address the most dangerous unknowns that you have as a customer. So again, a security organization or a software engineering organization, the first unknown is they don't know what software they've deployed. <laughs> so we have to give them a list and say, you have all these assets. You didn't know it, but you have all of these. The second thing is they don't know what they are testing. So saying, okay, let's figure out what you are testing and what you're not testing. Then they don't know the vulnerabilities in them. So we help them find the vulnerabilities. The fourth unknown is they don't know how to fix them. So we guide them on how to fix them. So we take the most important, the most dangerous unknowns and address them one by one by one. And then we rinse and repeat and keep doing it and they get stronger. But we, again, it's the thing that the unknowns they have is what causes them to lose sleep. It's not what they know that causes them to lose sleep, it's what they don't know. So we go and, and confront that upfront and say, we will tell you all the things you don't know that you need to know. So let's start by figuring out all your assets. And suddenly a company realizes they have thousands or tens of thousands of, of properties accessible by the inter from the internet that they weren't aware of. And then we start testing. Excellent. Well, Marcia, yeah. Alex, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. For ISMG, I'm Anna Delaney.